My name is Ken Tillman and I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Programs uh, in the College of Nursing at East Tennessee State University. Uh, I first met Dr. Gwen Sherwood when I was a graduate student and she was a faculty member at the University of Texas, that's the other UT. <laughs> the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. Dr. Gwen Sherwood is professor and associate dean for academic affairs at the University of North Carolina at Ch Chapel Hill. Or she is a faculty in the interprofessional Telluride Patient Safety Summer Camps Program, a member of the National pa Patient Safety Education Research Committee and co-investigator of the Quality and Safety Education for Nurses project, also referred to as CUSIN. She has been a leader in developing nursing education across borders, working with nursing faculty in China, Thailand, Macau, Mexico, and Kenya. She is past president of the International Association for Human Caring and was vice president of Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society for Nursing. She is co-editor of Quality and Safety in Nursing, a competency approach to improving outcomes and reflective practice, transforming education and improving outcomes. And again, it is my honor to welcome Dr. Gwen Sherwood. Good morning, and in my house it's frequently, which UT are you referring to? Because my husband was in one of the last graduating classes from the old Science Hill High School, the Hilltoppers, so he is a true Hilltopper. In fact, he joined me here and he drove via Johnson City to have dinner with old classmates because his, oh, I don't know, 100th or something, high school reunion is, got, don't tell him I said that, is coming up next week. And um, so we were always like, which UT are we really talking about? But I, actually, I'm a true Tar Heel. So I have to tell you. I'm going through a little bit of culture shock. I flew yesterday from the Telluride Science Institute um, for patient, summer camp for patient safety, where we were, we were at 10,000 feet altitude. And just as I got adjusted to the altitude, now I'm back in uh, the foothills of Tennessee. But very delighted to get to be with you today. And I've overachieved, so we're going to move really quickly through the next hour because I have a lot I want us to do. So I've been in Telluride, and our speaker on Tuesday was John Nance, a book I highly recommend, Why Hospitals Should Fly. It's a fictional account of the perfect hospital. John is a United Airlines captain, so he infuses patient safety with all the examples from aviation. So when um, an airline crew assembles to take us to our next destination where we want to go, they come together and they've probably never met each other, so they introduce themselves. But one thing that team has that might be an advantage as we think about it, they have a very clear purpose and goal. What is their purpose and goal? A safe flight to the de to the right destination. They want to get to the right airport safely for everybody, themselves included. So their purpose is already pretty well designated. So we may be coming together, particularly those of you who are involved in chronic care uh, and working with comorbidities. The purpose may not be so clearly identified. I also find when we come together for learning experiences. We need to also think about what's our purpose? Why are we here? So let me ask some of you, why are you here today? We're the IPE team at our university. You're the IPE team at your university, okay. And? We want to be here. You want to be here, I love that. <laughs> Somebody else, why are you here? I needed the CME. You need the CME, all right. Somebody else, there's no wrong answer. You wanted to go to Dollywood? I, how far is Dollywood? I, I don't even know. I've, do you know, all these hundreds of times I've been to Johnson City, I've never been to Pigeon Forge. So I was so excited to actually get to come to Pigeon Forge. So anybody else have a reason for being here? You wandered in from next door? 
You want to know what others are doing, and they've set up an agenda that you're going to get to do that. Okay, well, think about why you did come, and then what is it you want at the end of the day? What do you want to take with you? Some new ideas. Some new ideas, okay. About what? About, IP. about okay. Just wanted to be sure, okay. <laughs> I mean, it could be something different. What do you want today? New opportunities for collaboration. New opportunities for collaboration, yeah. Okay, somebody else? How to stimulate the team for collaboration. Sometimes that's pretty hard. Yeah. Well, what are you willing to invest? So think about your purpose, what you want to take with you. And then if you're going to achieve that, you really need to think about what are you willing to give it? What are you willing to invest today? This really stumps students when I start my class this way. What are you willing to invest? That means they have to turn off Facebook. So what are you willing to invest today? Are you willing to make an investment? Time, attention, and interaction. Time, attention, and interaction. Thank you. So just being here and physical presence alone won't get it. So time, energy, and interaction are really important. Well, I um, want to fulfill some objectives, some reasons why I came today for us to be able to l work on some of these ideas around interprofessional education. And we're going to do a lot of interactive activities. I also need to let you know that. And then I thought we would start the morning with aerobics. So we're going to do a little thumb wrestling. You remember that? I actually looked this up on Google. And there is actually an international federation of thumb wrestling. And if you do get bored today, and you've got your computer, Google thumb wrestling, and you will not believe what you will find. I got lost in all the web pages on thumb wrestling. I think it was like 14,000 hits or uh, possibilities. OK, so what we're going to do now, uh, this is going to get loud and noisy. So let me give you all the instructions first so that we reassemble quickly. All right, you're going to get a partner, and everybody remember thumb wrestling, you know, okay? You're, you're going to force each other's thumb down. And I'm going to give you 50, I'm going to give you a one, two, three, go. And I'm going to give you 15 seconds. And at 15 seconds, I want your attention back, and we're going to see who got the most wins. Uh, a win uh, is pushing the other thumb down. All right, I'm going to say three, two, one, go, 15 seconds, and then when I say in, I want you back. Okay? Three, two, one, go. Time. Uh-oh, she said we got a strong one up here. Okay. Let me hear some results. <laughs> Let me hear some results. How many did you get? Two. You got two. How many did you get? Zero. How many did you get? Somebody more than two? Anybody more than two? How many did you get? Seven. Anybody more than seven? Fourteen. Okay. All right. Let's go back. What were the instructions? What were the instructions? Who can get the most wins? So what did you immediately assume? Competition. If you had assumed cooperation, you would have gone, I win one, you win one. I win one, you win one, back and forth. And did you do that? Did you figure that out? So she got 14. How many? No, we got 14 together. Oh, OK. Okay, so she did you? Seven, I got seven. Okay, so, oh, 14 together. Okay, so you figured it out. Yeah. All right. So, you know, we automatically assume that we're in competition. So, when we come to think about interprofessional education and teamwork and collaboration, those are really complex concepts. And we do have a lot of assumptions about those terms and about what they mean. 
So we do have to begin to break it down and try to establish a shared mental model. If you look at this picture, I think you can immediately figure out somebody didn't get the message. And so we come with different language, different perceptions. We come with uh, different attitudes and stereotypes. So what are some stereotypes that we have to overcome? I put a few on the board to help you think. So what are some stereotypes? Competition, I think, is one of them, that we're competing with each other instead of collaborating and cooperating. You know, interprofessional education is not our end goal. Collaboration is not our end goal. What is the end goal? Why are we doing this? What's our real purpose? Improving outcomes. We really are coming together to improve patient care. And as Wendy said in her introduction, there's increasing evidence that links these two outcomes. And so trying to design health professions education to be able to set practitioners up, whatever the discipline, set our graduates up so that they really are able to be collaborative ready and go out and practice in a very different way. It's all about achieving the triple aims. IHI has put it together for us so that we are trying to have better patient care, improving health to be more efficient and affordable. And as I heard the list of grants that some of your faculty have had, I'm hearing a lot of efforts out of ETSU to really begin to try to do that. So how do we go about changing conversations so that we can begin to think about interprofessional education as a solution and how we can begin to put it together in our curricula. So one of the resources that we began to look to was this 2010 article that came out in The Lancet. It was a 20-member, actually an international commission. And some of the conclusions that they reached uh, is that we have out, practice has outstripped education. So if we are still teaching as we were taught, we are preparing people to work in a system that no longer exists. Now, if you can follow that grammar, I'm basically saying that we are continuing to prepare people for a healthcare delivery system that has already changed. That train has already left the station. So we have fragmented, outdated curricula, static curricula, ill-prepared graduates, competencies don't match, population needs. And in fact, when we start to look at the new models, they're all population health focused. And of course, we need stronger leadership. So some things that this uh, commission has said, and FF Melise was the one representing nursing, um, Dr. Frank is the um, Dean for Public Health at Harvard, uh, really a, a well-appointed committee. So they found in the health professions that we have tribalism, my tribe, your tribe, nursing, medicine, and we stick with our tribe, and we teach that way, we work that way. We have isolation, silo practice, and we are set, we've set ourselves up for competition and collaboration. The goal is to have mutual learning, joint problem solving within interprofessional teamwork. So then we have some other driving forces. The professions got together in 2010 and 11 and established the interprofessional education competencies, which are now really getting folded into our accreditation standards across the professions. So we're now all answerable for these um, standards that um, have been approved. So interprofessional education, you know the definition, when two or more come together to learn with, from, and about each other. And then the competency domains, which you are probably also familiar with, that are now being integrated <laughs> across the professions. And we at Chapel Hill have been talking about this for a number of years from nursing, could not get anybody to really get um, very excited about this until someone went to a conference and came back and saw these competencies and said, oh, we're all accountable. And things really started happening. So it's kind of a truism that regulations often drive change. 
instead of the desire for different outcomes driving change, but I'll take it. So you're familiar with these competencies and what we're trying to do around climates of mutual respect, patient-centeredness as a part of that, working within our team roles and responsibilities and making sure people are clear what those are. We were doing a research project between UNC and Duke, nursing and medical students. We were doing role play, low fidelity, and we would hear nursing students trying to ask um, residents, well, is an intern and a resident, are they the same thing? And then we would hear the residents and uh, the, the medical students saying, what is a charge nurse? Because that was one of the roles being played was a charge nurse. So who teaches that? Who tells people what the hospital organizational structure looks like or whatever the healthcare setting? Who makes sure that the players who are there understand the structure? Communication, how we teach a team approach, and of course, the teamwork behaviors, team dynamics, and then the steep model from out of IOM that care is safe, timely, efficient, effective, equitable, and patient-centered. So when we are trying to think about how we are to design learning experiences, we have a lot of resources to try to begin to pull together. So um, thank you, Ken, for mentioning QSIN, Quality and Safety Education for Nursing. That's nursing's answer to the 2003 Health Professions Report that established the quality uh, and safety competencies. My quarrel with that is that they rolled quality and safety into one. They do have distinct science, and I think subsequent to that report, I think it's pretty common to have quality and safety as separate competencies and to really look at those domains for what they each bring. We use a competency approach. Competencies have knowledge, skills, and attitudes. What do you need to know? What do you need to know how to do? And what's the attitude that shapes it? I think we know a good bit about the content, the knowledge. I also think we know a good bit about the skills that we need. Where I think our real challenge is how to change attitudes. Because we have to overcome those stereotypes. We have to overcome negative experiences that we have had and that we are then shaped by those. So how do we come with open, opening our minds and getting rid of some assumptions? So thinking about that, um, how we reshape and the competencies that we used in, from out of IOM that all the health professions are accountable, patient-centered care, informatics, quality improvement, evidence-based practice, <coughs> teamwork and collaboration, and safety. And so those definitions from out of the IOM apply to everybody. Nursing took those in the QSIM project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for seven years so that we could identify the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and we were careful not to use the word nurse because actually any profession could take those sets of tables that we developed, 162 objective statements, and really any professional could apply those. And so we have gotten those folded into all nursing accreditation standards, working with NLN and working with CCNE so that they are folded in. So the definition for teamwork, let's just break those words down and think about them a little bit. Learning to function effectively, and we did use the word nursing in the definition, but if you go back to the IOM, it simply says interprofessional teams fostering open communication, mutual respect, and shared decision making. We spent a great deal of time in Telluride on the shared decision making and shared decision making involving patient and family, patient advocates who really help us to understand that. Let's think about what collaboration. We often define teamwork, but we rarely stop to define collaboration. Collaboration is meeting goals without compromising relationships. So how do we begin to reach consensus? How did you come together to thumb wrestle and decide how you were going to do it and what was your rule for how you were going to apply that? So achieving a mutually satisfying result. Collaboration is like win-win. It isn't win-lose. 
lose, win, but win-win so that we have a commitment to a common mission. So true collaboration is a process. It's not an event that happens. It is a process, that, and we can have that in an ongoing manner. So if we take the IPEC four domains, roles and responsibilities, teamwork, values, ethics, communication, it's all done for safety. John Nance kept telling us in Telluride, you can do quality improvement. You can do evidence-based practice. You can do anything, but if it isn't for the purpose of improving patient safety outcomes, if you're not improving, then why do it? So safety kind of goes as the backdrop. And then we can put in the competencies that came out of the IOM. So we can see what feels like we're having to integrate a lot of disparate stuff. They actually are flowing in the same direction and they actually fit together very well and really can help us as we're trying to guide curricular change and begin to achieve some new outcomes. Learners think they know about each other. Um, but every once in a while, we realize the, the discrepancy between set attitudes or just lack of information. So we need to be designing immersion experiences so that they have the opportunity to actually practice communication and practice some of the skill sets, work on the attitudes that we find are proving to be barriers. So how, what are some strat tools and strategies that we can begin to use to try to open the conversation? I said we need to have disruptive innovation change the conversation. I don't know if anybody here familiar with liberating structures. I have really come to appreciate some new ways to have conversations in difficult situations. You can go to liberatingstructuresallwinword.com and there's 40 plus strategies that you can use to have group conversations. They're based on complexity science, but it creates conversation spaces so that you can change the conversation. I often say there's only one curriculum conversation. Anybody here on curriculum committees? And that conversation is don't touch my course, don't touch my content, I'm set, thank you. And we often no more content and thank you, no more content. So we have to rethink how we are doing business in our uh, educational institutions. So these are some ways that liberating structures can be used. So we're going to practice for just a few minutes. We're going to create a little more chaos. And these are just some examples. So we're going to focus right now on TRIZ. TRIZ is a made up word, and TRIZ is about learning from opposites. It's uh, how to design a perfectly adverse system and in that way, you can begin to think about innovation. So sitting at your table, here's your assignment. So I want you to focus on the question, what are the characteristics of the worst clinical work environment you can imagine? What would it be like? And just go round robin at your table and each person say, the worst, okay? The worst. And I'm going to give you... Oh, you're a really smart group, so let's have 30 seconds, okay? And then we'll come back together, all right? Go fast, now. Okay, let me hear a few thoughts of what's the worst clinical work environment that you can imagine. Somebody? Let, let's hear from a few tables. Hostility. Hostility, great. Another one. Incompetent. Incompetent. We're on a roll. Total lack of respect. Lack of, communication. lack of communication. Very good. So what is the ideal work environment? What are some characteristics that would create the ideal clinical work environment? Okay? 30 seconds. Rapid fire. Okay, let's reconvene. All right, what are some characteristics? You all got one? Um, positive outcomes. Positive outcomes. What's one from here? They're frozen. <laughs> a lot of collaboration. A lot of collaboration. Communication. Communication. Somebody else, what's an ideal work environment characteristic? 
trust. I'm very interested that I got quicker responses for the worst environment than the best environment. What's going on? So it seems like a strange exercise to identify the worst. And I normally don't go towards gap analysis because I'm an appreciative inquiry person. But I do think this liberating structures can provide an openness to be able to say what we would not say otherwise. Uh, I had tried other kinds of conversation to try to change how we were relating together. And so just really rethinking in an opposite kind of way to open the conversation. So that we have to be able to think about how we're going to shift the culture, how we're going to shift those attitudes towards a different mindset. So that, first of all, we have to have faculty engagement. We have to have faculty development. We found that out in CUSA. The first thing we had to do was go back to Robert Wood Johnson and say, all right, we got a game plan. We got the knowledge, skills, and attitudes, but our faculty don't know how to do this. And so we have to go back and think about how we're going to prepare faculty. The other thing we found out, we don't have common language across the professions. And I'm just going to dive right in, nurses. Sorry. But we have created some of that with nursing diagnosis. And that might be a great way to help students organize information, because we have to have ways to organize information. But I don't know a clinical setting anywhere that organizes nursing by nursing diagnosis. And when we start talking about that, we create an instant uh, tension. So we have to think about how do we come together and create common language? Physicians probably have a language set that doesn't communicate with nurses. So how do we begin to do that? We also have to think about that we teach communication differently. Um, I'm going to use another Telluride example. One of the nursing faculty was uh, preparing case studies for discussion, and she kept sending these huge emails. I mean, like, you know, if you printed it, it would be like two and three pages to the, her physician collaborator. He would come back with one word. OK, we began to catch on. We are communicating in a different style. So she started working on how she could begin to cut down. And she brought it up with him. And they talked about they did have very different communication styles. So we have to be open to that, to think about how we communicate differently. How do we establish an environment with role models, coaches? It goes back to that faculty development. We can get our students in an environment ready to do an interprofessional, but it can be killed with the culture that exists. So we need to be thinking about role models. I've never seen a bicamore, but I think it is a, a, an idea. So how do we change the conversation so that we repicture, refocus, and start again? So we do have to pay attention to the organizational culture where we are placing our learners. So culture is very important. What is the saying? Culture eats policy every day. Uh, so culture really drives how work gets done, just as the example in my office that I was telling you about. So organizational culture shapes how people work together. And you know that. When you think about it, you, you recognize that. And it's by having collective values, beliefs, and norms held by group members. I was in an, uh, doing a, a joint appointment when I was at UT Houston at Methodist Hospital. And we recognized that everybody, all meetings started late. So we decided we were going to change the culture. We were going to start meetings on time. And if only the chair of the committee was there, the chair of the committee would start the meeting. And when somebody came in late, do not restart the meeting. We were, every time somebody came in late, we recapped. So we never got anywhere. And so do you know within two weeks of just making that decision and sticking to it, we began to change the culture on that. So it's what do you accept as an OK behavior? Now, some behaviors are a lot harder to change than when you start a meeting. Trust me. I don't belittle how hard it is. But it's the interplay of structure, the reward system, the people themselves, the information system, how we communicate. In fact, it is the shared experiences, and that culture actually helps shape. It seems disconnected, but it actually helps shape how patient care is delivered. So it's the relationships up and down and how you solve problems and how you come together. 
So communication and culture. Communication is an essential organizational process. And in fact, some people say, if you take communication out of trying to really look at an organizational culture, you sort of don't have anything to talk about. So culture is lived through member interactions. So you can see how important that is to interprofessional collaboration. And when care is as complex as chronic care, and you have so many different providers trying to come together and coordinate care, it is particularly important. So we have to think about how group members receive, interpret, and evaluate the input. And so paying attention to the communication on a continual basis is a very important part of organizational culture, and it really does impact how we work together collaborative, collaboratively. So how do we begin to create that kind of culture? All right, who sees the circles? Okay, how many do you see? Oh, you have to unfocus, okay. Unfocus from what? Okay. 16, okay. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. So sometimes we see what we expect to see. It took me almost two days to figure out where the circles were. I kept going back and looking at that. Where are the circles? And finally, I began to realize it. Let me see if I can. Does everybody now see the circles? So sometimes we have to have a little help. So in organizational culture, sometimes we get the behaviors that we tolerate. We get the behaviors that we expect. So how do we reframe? And she, and she said it so perfectly. I have to refocus. And every time I look at this, I have to mentally retrain my eye to get past all the squares and rectangles. It is that difficult when we begin to try to reframe, refocus from solo, silo, single to team. So let's begin to think about some ways that we can start to rethink. So um, applying theory to learning design Experiential learning theory, social identity theory, reflective and experiential learning are some of those possibilities. And if you go to the literature, there are a number of papers that really work on that. Adult learning theory that helps us focus on learner-centered approaches. Uh, Practice-oriented educators, we ourselves have to retrain and refocus so that we come at it from a learner-centered perspective and that we come at it from a practice perspective. And so trying to co-create the learning environment. So we have to have a lot of shifts just in how we are approaching a learning experience so that we are able to redesign and rethink. So Kolb's uh, learning cycle first published in 1984. He's had several updates. I think the latest is 2011. But that whole thing of a concrete experience, reflective, doing the abstract conceptualization, and then experimenting really fits. It applies very well if you're thinking about simulation learning. But a lot of our learning experiences that we are thinking about with interprofessional um, curri curricula could really fit within uh, Kolb's learning cycle. So what are some, uh, uh, another report that's just come out that can help us in shaping curriculum and learning experiences is the IOM report that came out in April. And it's really looking at measuring the impact, a number of studies, um, a great synthesis, has a lot of tools in it. And so by looking at some of the ways learning is measured, I actually went back and rethought some of the learning experiences I had been using because of looking at the different outcomes that they've identified there. So knowledge, skills, and attitudes, and I just put up some of the things that we focus on within teamwork and collaboration and how we have to drill down from the broad definitions and then really think about within each learning experience, what's the purpose? What do we want at the end of the time that the learners are together? 
and what is it that we expect them to invest to be able to achieve. So we go right back to purpose and being able to think through the particular competency domains that we are working on and trying to put into the experience. So KSAs challenging our traditional approaches. Some of the things that we are beginning to think about, is it a single dose learning experience versus immersion? And so how do we design to have experiences over time to really build and cement behaviors so that they become a habit of the mind. But there's a lot out there to help guide the kind of learning experience, whether single or over time. So we have to rethink. We have to think about the content. We have to think about how long. Where does it go in the curriculum? Uh, some schools at the beginning before students have any experience, some spread it over time, uh, some for a semester. So we have to think about those things, the pedagogy. What are going to be the strategies? And then how do we assess? We really have to think about the assessment. Um, we also have to, as we're designing, thinking about the level within Bloom's taxonomy, you know, basic knowledge all the way up to synthesis and uh, what are we trying to measure and evaluate. So a lot of the basic um, learning theory has to go into planning what kind of instructional method. And then we have to have opportunities to be able to practice. Uh, nursing just had a national study on simulation, and the results are that up to 50% of face-to-face -face clinical time could be replaced with really well-designed, high-fidelity simulation, thus giving learners more opportunities to practice before they go into the real-world experiences. We're still figuring out what all of that really means. But we know that simulation does give the opportunity to practice some teamwork behaviors. So when we think about teamwork and collaboration, just some of the things that are important uh, ingredients within learning activities, I'm not going to read through all of this, but just how the organization managing differences and having input, welcoming input from all group members, regardless of discipline. Uh, I have to talk a lot with, and I'm using a lot of nursing examples, but that is my background. But I have to work a lot with nurses about passenger syndrome, of just being along for the ride and not feeling like they have the skills or the empowerment to speak up. But we're the 24-7. We're the assessment. And if we don't share our information in a way that the team can make the best decision, we are compromising care. And we have to recognize the role that we have and really step up. The most patient-centered thing we can do is an accurate assessment and sharing that information across the team. From out of team steps, anybody using team steps? Um, we have this model. You can go to ahrq.gov. It's free, downloadable. You can also get a little CD. It used to be an eight-pound notebook. Oh, I love it now. don't have to lug that around. But this is the model. Um, it, has, it is an evidence base. came out of the Department of Defense, and ARC is now distributing it nationally. You can become master trainer. Teaches SBAR situation, what's going on, the background assessment recommendation. Anybody using SBAR? Uh, it's a basic way of communication. I also taught this to my office staff. Um, to challenge rule, I just want to give you a few things that can be uh, skill sets that you can include in curricula. I am concerned. I am uncomfortable. It's a safety issue. Cuss. We're trying to teach that to our faculty for some organizational issues around communication in our School of Nursing. Uh, where we talk about I am uncomfortable and I think that we need to um, improve communication. So situational awareness, knowing current conditions that affect how the team can work together. So an ER, short-staffed, busy, accident uh, victims brought in is just a setup for a true challenge. So it is with patients with chronic conditions that require multiple providers. So we have to have situational awareness of what are the conditions that are going, the context, what's going on in the environment so that we maintain mindfulness. And that is a real challenge, to maintain attentive mindfulness so that we 
are not upset and off our carefulness uh, and proceeding according to standardized protocols when we become so busy. And so we have to maintain situational awareness about what's happening with our patients and then also the operational issues that are going on amongst all team members. So some conditions that undermine situational awareness is um, failure to share information. You brought that up. Failure to request information from others. Failure to direct information to specific team members. Failure to include the patient or the family. And failure to use resources that are available to their maximum. And so these are some of the things that really undermine interprofessional practice, interprofessional education. So reflection as a way of trying to bring focus, bring that attentive presence. Reflection helps us with tacit knowledge, how we merge content theory within experiences. Expert practitioners learn how to do this so that you can be more present in the moment. Learning through story, narrative pedagogy, case studies can really help when we bring different disciplines together to learn. The spirit of inquiry, reflection is a positive change model of learning to ask questions, questions that really guide critical analysis of experience. It helps us to develop clinical judgment. How do we go grow from novice to expert? As we use experience as a learning platform, constantly mining and thinking about what just happened, making sense of practice, grasping the whole of the situation. It looked like just um, a case of miscommunication with the uh, emergency department case we just looked at. As we began to go deeper into that case, we saw more and more possibilities for mistakes to occur. So reflective practice, thinking about what we do, analyzing, developing a practice model of mindful presence, making sense of experience, but thinking deeply about my role as a team member. No team is any stronger than individual members. And so when I'm given $40 million to start my own school, the first thing I'm going to do is start with emotional intelligence because I think as we develop our own sense of self-awareness, the impact that we have on the other person, how we learn to modulate and how we respond to each other, we can begin to break the cycles. We can begin to break down the stereotypes and the barriers that we have for working together. So let's look quickly in our last minute. Just wanted to leave you with a few things about assessment and evaluation. I strongly urge you to examine Kirkpatrick's model. We mostly measure uh, is satisfaction but how do we go deeper into levels? And it's particularly tricky with interprofessional education. How do we know that it was the interprofessional part of the experience versus other intervening factors? So there's a lot uh, how we use briefing, huddling, and debriefing. These are reflective models of how we come together to plan, how we problem solve. Anyone can call a huddle at any point that you are concerned about what's happening. Uh, debrief how we consider next time. We are learning that taking even one minute at the end of a code experience for the team to debrief changes the experience for the next time. Uh, back to liberating structures uh, and other tools, visual thinking strategies. A lot of schools are taking interprofessional teams to museums so they analyze a painting. We find that by looking and examining a painting, <clears throat> you're able to begin to teach observation and attention to detail and people will, are more who are reluctant to speak up in a clinical setting will contribute their thoughts looking at a painting and what they see because what you see first is not always what you see later. Students reports about using visual thinking strategies they say looking at a busy painting is like walking into an intensive care unit for the first time. You see such a complex picture, you have no idea where to begin. But as you begin to focus on a detail, you begin to break down 
and you see the patient, and then you begin to break down what are all the tubes, what are all the different infusions. And so you can begin to teach learners how to break down really complicated processes through um, using art. So there are just endless possibilities. I find it so exciting to begin to start and work on the different ways that we can bring learners together to be able to um, uh, create learning. A lot of low fidelity team building games uh, like thumb wrestling, we've got a whole, Carol Durham and I have just worked up a whole repertoire of things that we are trying to use to, as icebreakers and other ways to begin to break down the silos uh, begin to establish common language. Let me go back. Common language using visual thinking strategies and art is one of the ways that you can begin to do that because descriptive words are so important. The words we use in a chart, the words we use to convey assessment information sticks. We have records of patient deaths because the wrong descriptive word is used. So we really have to be attentive to the language that we use. So. Finally, just sort of putting it together, we do have barriers, but we have a lot of strategies to overcome those. We know the outcomes that we want to achieve, and when we focus on those outcomes, we are able to eliminate the barriers and really begin to focus on it. I stood on a hilltop in Arlington Cemetery that's been there for 150 years, and last year they noted the 400,000th grave marker. When you go to Arlington Cemetery, all you see are white markers. It's a, just a wash, and, and you're overwhelmed with the number, and you, you can't think. You only begin to recognize it when you walk up to one individual marker and you see the name, you see the face. So it is when we hear 400,000 deaths, we're overwhelmed. How do we begin to get to zero? What do we do? It isn't until we see the face of medical era that we see one person, one family whose life is changed forever. That is why we are focusing on interprofessional education because we have evidence that that might begin to take us towards zero. Will we ever get to zero? We don't know if we don't start by getting 400,000 to 300,000, but we are filling Arlington Cemetery every year. And that is not acceptable. So we have to really think about what is it that we can do. So go back and think about why you're here, what you want at the end of this day, and what you're willing to invest. And I hope that at least one reason why you're here is you are committed that you are going to help reduce that 400,000 and begin to chase zero in every way that we can. And I am so delighted to be with you. And I think this is on the conference website and a few links that you can go to. Thank you so much for the opportunity.